Welcome to today's webinar brought to you by Quest and DataVail. I'm Stephen Fagg, Director of Database Trends and Applications in Unisphere Research. I will be your host for today's broadcast. Our presentation today is titled Key Database Management Skills and Tools for the Cloud Era. Before we begin, I want to explain that you can be a part of this broadcast. There will be a question and answer session. If you have a question during the presentation, just type it into the question box provided and click on the submit button. We're going to try to get to as many questions as possible later. Plus, all viewers today will be entered for a chance to win a $100 Amazon gift card just for participating. Now, to introduce our speakers for today, we have Julie Hyman, Director of Product Management at Quest, and Michael Argawal, Director and Global Practice Leader, Cloud Databases at DataVail. Now I'm going to pass the event over to Julie to get us started. Welcome to the broadcast, Julie. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate uh, being here. Um, okay, so let me uh, jump into uh, my topics for today. First of all, who am I? Uh, hold on. Okay, so I've been with Quest since 2010. Seems like a lifetime I've been here. Uh, beyond that, it's 20 plus years now of working with DBAs, developers, and data analysts, working on tool sets and productivity. Um, and currently, I manage all of our information management products, including the Toad product line, Foglight, Shareplex, Apex, SQL, Stat, Spotlight, and others. So that's my current role here at Quest. Um, just to start with a little quote here about the future of cloud computing, and, and this is one I heartily agree with, right, that the definition of cloud is really the future, right, and this is, it's going to be leveraged by IT like a utility, right, so it's going to become something super common, um, a, a, a part of our infrastructure we sort of take for granted going forward. Um, and let me start also with a little story. So, um, this is a story about database as a service. And if you've heard of Zapier, fantastic company, truly amazing the growth that they've achieved. And if you take a look at them, they've actually achieved it with very little capital startup, right? They went directly from you know, being a startup to being profitable within two years. Within the first three years, they had 600,000 customers. Um, and then as of September 2023, it's the automation platform of choice for 99% of the uh, four, uh, Forbes Cloud 100. So they absolutely grew fantastically fast. And one of the reasons they grew so fast is because they really took uh, advantage of database as a service. So they could scale at an unbelievable rate. So as successful as their product was, they could, they could fully scale in that environment. However, um, the, the CEO of the company, um, Wade, he tells a story about how they had a costly lesson at first, and which is um, one of their Elasticsearch searches they left on uh, without tuning it, and they left it on for a period of days and turned around to a huge bill through AWS um, that they were not expecting at all. Um, and so just to kind of drive home the point that tuning um, when you're talking about database as a service, when you're talking about database as a service at all or any cloud services, cost is key. It's something you have to really consider because you're paying for what you use, right? That's the beauty of it. But it's also one of the the gotchas in there. And so you learn, have to become an expert at tuning. And things that might have affected performance in the past are going to affect your bottom line very quickly um, in this environment. Okay. So what are the challenges facing the databases that are having us move into the cloud and make it so attractive? Uh, first, DBAs are overloaded. Everybody knows this, right? The velocity of data has driven the, uh, the amount of databases that we're managing huge. Not only that, but the variety of databases that data, uh, DBAs are managing is off the charts. No longer are we like an Oracle only shop or a SQL server only shop. We're managing tons of databases across different estates with different platforms. And because we're doing that, we're having to focus our attention everywhere rather than just focusing on the key products, right? So if you're doing patching and upgrading, you're doing your maintenances, you're doing backup and recovery, you're doing it for all of your databases in your environment, you aren't focusing on the ones that are most important. You just don't have the time. As databases or DBAs are overloaded, so developers are slowed down, right? So developers need to uh, create and destroy databases quickly. Sometimes they need DBA help for that if it's not fully automated. Also, you know, DBAs, as they make changes to databases, the DBAs are, are developers as they make changes to databases. The DBAs are intricately involved in that uh, CI CD cycle, right? Getting those changes into production. And so if your DBAs are overloaded, they're typically the bottleneck in that uh, DevOps pipeline. 
so our DBAs are overloaded, our developers are slowed down. And then truly as more open source databases are uh, embraced by the industry as enterprise ready, um, you're finding more and more applications, not only using them, but using multiple kinds of database platforms. And so in the past where an application might settle on, hey, we're an Oracle backend application. Now you're gonna see uh, applications that have more than one backend, uh, more than one database. And so this pro proliferation of databases is not slowing down at all, which of course starts this whole cycle up again. So database as a service as Gartner likes to call it, database platform as a service is the dominating growth area of databases. So we've got a chart here. This is from Gartner's uh, last year uh, came out uh, with this uh, analysis. But look at the last piece. That's the key to the puzzle here. For 2022, 98% of the overall database market growth came from database platform as a service. So yes, databases are growing, but the percentage where they're growing, right, where the real key where they're growing is database uh, as a service. So what's the difference? And I know my, my fellow speaker here today will go into this in a little bit more detail, but I just wanted to give a quick slide here that just gives you uh, an idea of what the benefits are to each one of this of versus on-prem, where you have total control over your environment, but it's a heavy investment at first, and total control means you're managing everything versus infrastructure as a service. This is where you're using uh, the infrastructure, the, the, um, the hardware, right? You're outsourcing that, you're renting the hardware uh, from the cloud, but you're still in charge of installing their databases, patching your databases, ma managing them. So you're not get, quite getting the full benefit. And then lastly, this database as a service, this is where you're renting this entire environment. You're giving up control, right? You're not managing that environment, but you're gaining a lot, right? You're renting it so the, uh, the upfront costs are lower. You're able to offload all of those maintenance activities onto your provider. Um, and it really opens up the DBAs to focus on those things that are really important, like tuning and optimization, performance, et cetera. Um, so those are the three side by side. As I said, uh, I know that the next presentation will go into this more. Um, but I want to point out again, there's risks and regrets for database as a service. It seems like a no brainer at first where I build out that infrastructure if I can just rent it, but it's unexpected costs, it's performance issues. It's that loss of control. Um, you're, you know your business best and you know what your business needs best, right? You can make those priority calls for your business, but you're handing that, you're partnering that with your cloud provider when you're doing this. Uh, security and compliance concerns, you know, you're relying on their security and compliance um, assurances, but if they fail, you fail as well, right? Data migration challenges, often this is a big cost as well. Moving data uh, is difficult. Moving data can be very expensive as well. And then vendor lock-in. People are always afraid of vendor lock-in. They want to make sure that, hey, I've got so many choices today. I want to make the right one, but I don't want to hobble myself in the future by choosing one that's not going to um, advance as quickly or potentially will end up costing more than if I had made another choice. So all of those things in mind though, it's really about striking that right balance. And, and you guys know intuitively, right? You have to, you wanna maintain as much control as seems reasonable while offloading the cost by renting those services and renting those environments. Okay, so how is this changing the skill set, right? Is the, the crux of why we're here. If you look past in the past from 2010 and before, our DBAs were focused in these four areas, like maintenance, backup and recovery, patching and upgrades and security management. This is how they spent most of their time. And again, oftentimes in 2010 and, and before, they were lucky enough just to have to do this on a single database platform, right? An Oracle only shop, for example. But today, no, it's cloud migration and management, it's automation, it's DevOps and security and governance, right? You've got to deal with as many databases as you can. And a lot of that is offloading those activities you did on your own, like the backups and the patching to a cloud provider so that they're doing all that maintenance for you and you're focusing on the important things. It's learning to automate everything that you can, right? If it's something that needs to be done repeatedly, if you can automate that and become an expert at automation and really understand the tools out there for automation, you're gonna get a leg up on freeing up your time to focus on the more important things. DevOps, you have to be a good partner with DevOps to be a successful DBA, right? This whole idea of getting things to market as quickly as possible, uh, 
important to organizations. This is their competitive edge. And the DBA cannot afford to be the backlog in these situations. Um, and, and then at the same time, with all of this fast moving stuff ahead of you, right, migrating and automating and DevOps, making sure that your security and your governance is covered without holding you back, right? And that's a, that's a hard balance sometimes to hold because as you know, working with security and governance folks, they're always looking for the least amount of risk, but there's risk inherent in a lot of this stuff. And so you have to always be looking at security and governance for just the right balance of security and governance. So you've got your risk covered, but you're still moving fast. Okay, so when you're looking at solutions and tooling for the cloud area, what are the areas that we at Quest feel are really important to look for? Um, and the first one is uh, cross-platform. Uh, no longer can anyone afford to be a single platform only tool. Your tool needs to be something that you can adopt for your Oracle legacy environment, but also when you start pulling in Postgres and moving to Postgres, those tools can work just as well with those Postgres environments, those Snowflakes, those Databricks, right? So you wanna make sure that whatever tooling, it has cross-platform um, in its DNA. It's not just a single tool set or a single uh, platform tool set. Um, you want to make sure that it has observability as part of its DNA as well, right? You're giving up so much control as you move to the cloud. And so the only way you can get that back is through observability. You might not be able to uh, tweak everything you need in that environment, but you need to know when things need to be tweaked, right? So you're responsible for the observability and you might have to work with your cloud provider to actually make the changes. But observability has to be part of every tool that you bring in. You can't be a closed environment. Um, security, we talked about this. It's not just the security of your data, although that is always prime, uh, premier because it's really not your data, is it? It's your customer's data a lot of cases. So you want to make sure that it's secure and you can answer those questions on governance and regulations. But also secure software development lifecycle. You want to make sure that you, the tools that you're bringing in-house are uh, not making you vulnerable, right, to different kinds of hacking or different kind of exploits. You want to make sure that all the software you bring in is following that secure software development lifecycle standards. Um, and then lastly, we believe strongly in AI. I think, you know, we've seen the move to the cloud over the last, let's say, 10 years just really accelerate, uh, but AI is different. AI is changing everything so much more quickly, right? We've gone through a very short hype cycle on Gen AI to real use in the real world, right? So incorporating natural language processing, predictive analytics, anything Gen AI can do and machine learning into these tool sets so that they make you faster, right? Offload tedious tasks into AI um, so that you can, again, focus on what's important. So again, these are four areas we think that whatever tooling you're looking at should be have a, a, a strong message around, a strong um, story. And then lastly, we think we have that. So uh, right here, I've just uh, listed four different brands that we have at Quest. At Quest, we, uh, we're really proud of the brands that we support. So Irwin by Quest for data intelligence and data modeling. And this is really important with data, uh, data governance, that you have an, an insight into your data environment, that you know your lineage of your data. Shareplex by Quest. Shareplex basically invented data replication. Um, it st started with Oracle, but now it's working with Postgres and all of the newer, uh, newer sources and targets. So Shareplex has been around for over 25 years. It's bulletproof when it comes to replication. Uh, Foglight is all about observability, right? It's observability and monitoring and specifically with a database focus. Not your whole environment necessarily, but this one goes deep, deep, deep into your database environment. So you can make those decisions when you have database as a service, you can see what's happening out there. And then lastly, Toad. So Toad's a well-known uh, desktop tool uh, started off with Oracle, but it, now it's heterogeneous. It can support any platform that you have. It's all about making your DBAs, your developers, whoever's working with your database, all that more productive. Um, so I would say check out these these products. We have uh, great salespeople that can do a demo. We've got great uh, trials that you can download. And so we've got some QR codes you can use for that. And that is it for me. Surely. Okay, at this point in time, it's my pleasure to reintroduce our next speaker. Once again, Michael Argawal, Director and Global Practice Leader, Cloud Databases at Datavail. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so before I start, just a few minutes about me and the company I work for. Um, I have 25 years of experience. I've been a DBA, software developer, 
in past, uh, currently I lead a, a global practice. Uh, we managed uh, cloud migrations, uh, site reliability engineering, and uh, NoSQL uh, on behalf of customers. I have uh, uh, 10 years plus years experience with both AWS and Azure. A uh, little bit about the company I work for. I'm not going to go over uh, all these uh, points here, but uh, we definitely have a lot of credentials and a lot of project success uh, helping customers out on AWS, Azure, and Oracle. Uh, we uh, do both SQL Server, Oracle, but also a uh, big supporter of open source databases like MariaDB, MySQL, Postgres SQL, and MongoDB. And we support customers or help with migration on AWS, Azure, and OCI. Uh, Dataville uh, is known for uh, data and analytics. Uh, so a lot of customers also uh, building data warehouse, data lakes, and they are asking Dataville to help. Uh, Dataville also has a business unit to help with the application development. So today, um, you know. What, what the topics are, right? So I wanna, I'm going to cover over what is changing, how the dynamics and the landscape is changing and the role of DBA is changing and then what tooling uh, or the adjustments we have to make uh, to accommodate that. So what is changing? Um, it used to be that you have just a um, OLTP, right? Transactions and you're not necessarily interested in getting or you're not have the technology to support uh, all the sensor data or the images or videos, right? Now, the technology is here to ingest um, millions of records per second. Per second. Uh, not only that, uh, it used to be very few companies will be able to do that. Now, with the power of cloud, uh, you can create an environment where you can ingest a lot of data you can ingest images, videos, and whatnot. So something which was uh, everybody was very hesitant to do before, now it's a lot more open. There are also applications which demand a global scale, um, a global deployment. So a global deployment could be just a disaster recovery in a secondary region, or it could be active-active. And some applications might require a multi-region multi active-active deployment, and that that is changing also. So, so applications like DoorDash, um, Uber, they all ask for a global scale um, uh, deployment and databases. Uh, as uh, Julie covered earlier on, uh, there are many more database engines now. Just, you know, used to be SQL Server Oracle uh, on relational, relational databases. We see customers are using MySQL, PostgreSQL, a lot more. Um, NoSQL databases being adopted like uh, MongoDB, Cassandra. And, and it's all use case driven in the sense, uh, if I'm looking for more relationship between nodes, I might go for graph database. If I, if I have a more JSON documents, I may go for MongoDB, for example. Uh, so, or if I have a time series data, I might pick a time series database like Neo4j or, or Prometheus or something like that. So. So a lot more uh, use case driven databases that uh, organizations are adopting compared to just staying on, you know, just Oracle or SQL or some one one database only. Uh, with the with the cloud comes uh, cloud native databases. Uh, what that means is some databases are repurposed and and offered as a platform as a service. So for example, AWS has RDS, Aurora, which is a hosted solution for many database engines. Azure has managed instances, but also uh, AWS and Azure, they also developed uh, some new databases, which uh, for example, AWS DocumentDB uh, under the hood, not MongoDB, but it's compatible with uh, MongoDB. Uh, AWS DB uh, built from ground up. Uh, same for uh, Azure Cosmos DB, for example. So a lot of cloud native databases, a lot of options there. Uh, this is relatively new, uh, the vector databases. Uh, so uh, AI ML has been around um, at least a decade, a, a decade uh, but last two, three years, we see a rise in generative AI vector databases. And there are now organizations which are using uh, vector databases like Postgres SQL, MongoDB, uh, which support vector search, but also Pinecone and VV8. And, and those are the, some of the new adoptions. 
Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Quest. I, uh, I used Arwen for data modeling. So I used to do Visio. I went, went from Visio to Arwen. So it was just a mind blowing experience using Arwen. Um, so big fan of Arwen, how it can create models and generate uh, data definition language and all that. Uh, and then also Fog Lite. Uh, but also there are a lot more observability tools uh, in the market. So you probably heard about uh, Splunk and Dynatrace and AWS as a CloudWatch, Azure as an Azure Monitor, um, uh, RedKit. There are many uh, observability tools out there. So uh, trying to make uh, uh, observability work when you have hybrid environment, when, when you have multi-cloud, uh, a multi-cloud environment, observability, patching, all those aspects are a little bit challenging. And that's what makes a life of the DB a little bit harder because now not only you have to be expert in SQL Server and Oracle, but you have to kind of adopt to this uh, changing dynamics. So this slide used to be a, um, you know, aha moment five years ago, but I think a lot of people now know this thing. So I'm not going to Go in a lot of detail. So on prem, on prem, you're responsible for everything. Uh, when you go to uh, like a VM to VM migration, so a VM on prem to AWS EC2 or Azure VM, uh, you don't have to worry about data center or virtualization layer, but you still have to worry about uh, the OS patching, installing your SQL Server, Oracle, whatever database you might be using, setting up backup, and all those aspects of it. Uh, the managed service has a little bit different definition depending on which service you use, but in general, uh, the you don't have access to OS. Uh, OS patching, patching is taken care of by the uh, cloud provider behind the scenes. So you just put a maintenance window and behind the scene, the scripting automation kicks on and do the patching. Uh, same for database, uh, minor or major version upgrades. So backups is just a checkbox. HA is just a uh, checkbox. Uh, scaling um, is uh, something that you have to, you can schedule in a maintenance window or you can just very easy to just pick a different instance type, for example. Uh, DR is also a very easy setup. So all those things are very easy. Not necessarily that cloud provider will do by default, uh, but it's definitely a lot easier to set up. Uh, in some cases, just a, just a checkbox. Uh, but as a customer or a shared responsibility model, you're still responsible for what goes in the database, the schema, the database objects, the database code, and indexes, and all those aspects of it, tuning your queries, are you still responsible for as, as a DBA or a, or a database developer? Um, if you are, so it's a quick comparison, if you are on-prem versus cloud, uh, the installation has uh, evolved. Uh, you might have used PowerShell scripting, but uh, the cloud support a lot more modern tools like Terraform, Ansible, uh, Cloud Formation, uh, Azure um, Resource Manager Template, uh, Python script. So some of these you can still do on-prem, but cloud definitely makes a lot easier. Uh, backups, if you're using VM to VM, no changes. But if you're using managed service, as, as simple as just enabling it. Um, High ability disaster recovery. If still, uh, if you're doing VM to VM, no changes. You have to set up all on your own. Uh, but for managed service, uh, sometimes it's provided by default. In some cases, it's just a checkbox. Performance monitoring. This is, I think, uh, the strength or the the thing that a DBA uh, or database management provide is. This is where uh, you know when I was a DBA, I was pretty proud of able to troubleshoot performance uh, problems, whether it's a CPU memory index or bad query or contention on the disk, what, 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 whatever it might be. And that those those diagnosis, if you have a tool, it's going to help a lot, definitely. It, it's going to help you find the problem faster. But as a DB, you still shine and still, uh, whether it's a cloud on-prem, you know, that's definitely area that hasn't changed much. Security and compliance, um, I would say anything hypervisor or below is a lot easier. You know, who's goes in and out of data center, OS uh, patching, uh, hypervisor, you don't have to worry about. All those aspects are a lot easier, security compliance, but anything above that, you're still responsible for, and it's still same, whether it's on-prem or cloud. I remember uh, when, I, when we used to place an order for database servers, physical server or VM, um, we had to do a lot of benchmarking just to make sure we don't get it wrong. We want to be right. Uh, whether it's a benchmarking for disk IO or CPU or memory, 
We don't want to over provision. We don't want to under provision. And and ordering process may take two or three months to get an order set up in a data center and whatnot. So you have to be very uh, thorough in your capacity planning. Uh, with cloud, is uh, create and destroy kind of mindset in the sense, if it doesn't work, you destroy and create again. Uh, and you don't have to have that ex extensive planning. And if if something changes, you can get it something new very fast. Uh, ETL is not changed much. Uh, the tooling might work. So for example, you know, a lot of folks on AWS might use Glue or on Azure, you might use a data factory or there are many modern tools, uh, Talent uh, and Informatica and whatnot. You know, they all adopted and made cloud friendly tools. So ETL doesn't change as much, just, just the tooling. Uh, the work is still there. Uh, the one thing I like about cloud is uh, is allow you to be uh, a little bit more agile in the sense um, if something doesn't work out, you're experimenting, is easy to destroy it and not, not have to pay for upfront. Like if you are experimenting on-prem, you may have a big expense upfront uh, compared to cloud. You can experiment faster and find out pretty soon. If it's working, keep it. If it doesn't uh, working, then you can destroy it. The global replication um, on a data center, you of course have to have your own data center or rent it out, and then you have to set up a replication on a cloud. It's a lot easier to do a global replication across the regions. Um, in some cases, it's just a either a uh, async uh, in a secondary node, or you in some cases uh, doing it like a backup uh, sync. Uh, scaling is also a lot easier on the cloud um, on an on-prem. If you have a really uh, robust VMware environment or Hyper-V environment, you can switch out very faster. Or on a cloud, definitely it's a lot easier to switch out. Database design and development. Uh, the Arvind tool can help, and many other database development tools can help you there. And that's where another data modeling expertise shines. And there's not much change there. Designing tables, primary key, foreign key, uh, based on this on the query pattern, getting the right schema, all those are really good strength that uh, database developers and DBAs must have to continue to excel in that area. Database deployment, um, you know, there are tooling out there, DevOps tooling uh, out there, which kind of changes slightly, but deployment is a deployment. You may have DDL scripts or DML scripts. Uh, cloud not going to change as much, but if you're adopting DevOps or other processes, uh, Brew green deployment, for example, A-B testing environment, for example. There are many models out there for DevOps and, and deployment. So that might change uh, uh, that, but not but not just because you're going to the cloud, it's going to change depo deployment. That's not the case. The data centers, uh, as you can imagine, uh, as uh, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Oracle man managing these data centers, uh, they have a lot of automation, a lot of uh, processes in place, so you can expect more reliability from these data centers. Uh, virtualization layer, um, I remember when initially VMware Hyper-V came out and it allowed a lot of customizations and some customizations end up being a poor configuration and you end up being a poor for performing VMs and whatnot. Um, with cloud, the hypervisor is taken care by a cloud provider. Uh, not only that, it detects a problem with the hypervisor layer and actually switch you to a more stable and and uh, more stable and reliable uh, uh, VM instance, for example. So a lot of automation, auto detection um, is in place in addition to virtualization by the cloud providers. The database major and minor upgrades I covered that earlier. Um, in a cloud, you, you can schedule that in your maintenance window and behind the scene. The, the automation put in place by cloud provider to detect that you want to do major or minor up version upgrade in that automation uh, on, on your maintenance window, it kicks off the automation and, and does it for you. So very good, easy to do in cloud. So with that cloud comes uh, a lot of questions. Sometimes uh, customers are worried about performance and I can guarantee you uh, if, it's a, if it's a cloud and you properly properly configured, you can you can you are going to get same or better performance in cloud. There's a single digit uh, latency within the uh, within a region in a zone, even less same blue zone. 
you have many options for disk, uh, a regular hard drive. Uh, if you have data lakes, a lot of data maybe, uh, but general purpose SSD seems to be a lot pricing wise, very similar to hard drive. Uh, but then you also have a high throughput. Uh, Azure has premium SSD uh, and AWS has provision IOPS, for example. So you can definitely have a high throughput disk. Uh, you can vertically scale if you are single instance or read write for example SQL server for example you can vertically scale many cpus and many memory memory now goes all the way to ter one terabyte uh, the, the one thing about uh, cloud also is if you're doing any, any kind of microservices or a horizontal scaling architecture you can have scaling groups scaling groups could be uh, you can have vms or um, uh, or containers which can auto scale up and down to kind of keep it in line with the uh, the um, uh, the metrics uh, of load, uh, but also there are options like serverless which will auto scale also. So you have a lot easier to uh, enable and perform horizontal scaling if you're using cloud. And of course, GPU quantum computing also there. Uh, you can run GPUs for by hour, by second, for example, um, and experiment your AI machine learning workloads. Uh, cloud gives you more flexibility. Um, so if you have uh, infrastructure, infrastructure as a code, uh, for example, Terraform, you can create same environments, dev, test, prod very quickly. You can create and destroy very quickly. You destroy the stack. Uh, it destroys all the resources in that stack, for example. Um, is give you flexibility to create HA for production only if you want to, or all environments if you want to, very easy to create disaster recovery. And of course, you can start the project anytime. You don't have to wait for hardware to come from uh, Dell or HP. You just, you know, just provision things you need to provision. Um, it also have people who want to do less and less overhead for database management. Uh, you have more cloud native options uh, that for, for databases and many other services that you can use. Uh, for example, you can do open source Kubernetes for containers, or you can use AWS Elastic Kubernetes Service or Azure Kubernetes Service on Azure. So it makes your management of Kubernetes very easily. Uh, Compute, you have three options, uh, virtual machines, containers, serverless. So it, you can pick your architecture. Uh, each one has pros and cons, um, and then one of the flexibilities, there's no long-term commitment. Uh, the only exception will be when you're doing a reserved, uh, uh, res reserved instances and getting some discounts, then there, there's some, uh, there's some, uh, some things you can do to keep the cost down. Um, so if somebody tell you uh, that cloud is not secure, it's a, they are wrong. Um, and the cloud makes security a lot easier. Uh, Anything hypervisor below is taken care by cloud provider and anything above that, uh, you are responsible in a shared responsi uh, share responsibility model. But the, but the biggest thing is cloud gives you, even for the things you're responsible for, cloud gives you tools to make it really easy. So for, for example, encryption decryption, you can use uh, cloud provided encryption decryption or you can use your own keys, for example. You can manage certificate lifecycle. You can, there's a, uh, Azure has a key vault and AWS has secrets manager parameter store, for example. You can manage your secrets and connection strings there. You can manage permissions, you know, so, so there are a lot of things you can do a lot easier. So in my, my opinion, uh, cloud is a lot more secure compared to on-prem. Now this is a bigger topic, and if you want to take a screenshot, you can. I think this this really generate, and everybody on this call likely belong in one of these pillars, right? So as you modernize uh, your environment, you're looking beyond databases, you're looking at analytics, you're looking at applications which might uh, be running on those databases. You're working with infrastructures, optimizing their security, right? All those are interconnected. And as you modernize that, all these pillars need to be in sync. They need to have a cloud center of excellence to kind of help them, guide them, uh, adopt cloud, but also do really good in cloud. Uh, less cost, more security, is, and higher performance is, is, is the objective. So how you bring all these teams together, 
Um, and that's where the cloud center of excellence, cloud governance come into place. The cloud center of excellence and cloud, cloud governance, uh, whatever you call it in your organization, it's not a uh, red tape or, or a bureaucratic process. It's an enabler in the sense it provides the standards or the tooling or the template that everybody can follow and move fast and bring everybody on the same page. And then it kind of give you roadmap of what you're modernizing first, you know, so you might modernize analytics first. A second uh, phase may be modernizing application databases together. Uh, or third phase could be modernizing an infrastructure backup security tooling. So all those aspects kind of play a bigger role uh, when you bring into this, this discussion. With that, uh, um, I will turn over back to Stephen for the any questions that we have from audience. Absolutely. Uh, we have a lot of questions to get through, so I'm excited to go through these uh, with Julie and Michael. Um, so I've got some group discussion questions that I would like to pose to you both, and we also have a running tally of um, attendee questions as well that I'd like us to at least uh, you know get it, get through as many as we can. So first question, Julie, I'm going to let you start on this one. How has the growth of hybrid and multi-cloud environments impacted database management? So, I mean, the impact is, is huge, right? Because while you can offload some of your daily activities into these environments, as we just talked about, right, you can hand over some of the management tasks in, if you're doing database as a service or even a infrastructure as a service. Uh, the fact that the cloud is there and it's available means that the DBAs are having to support more and more platforms, right? Companies are taking advantage of the of the cloud infrastructure, and so they have to manage more. Um, but they're managing more with a little bit less control. And so they're kind of switching their uh, their focus, their tool sets, their skills into managing and optimizing versus that we we'll talk about patching and, and, and upgrading. Uh, so I think it's turning them into more strategic partners with the business um, than, than simply technicians, right? Because they're now partnering with their cloud provider and partnering with to try to get the best that they can out of their applications. And while being able to transfer some of those daily activities over to uh, the cloud providers to manage. Michael, is this what you're seeing as well when you talk with your customers? Yeah, I think the, the yes, exactly. And the other thing is when you do have a hybrid environment, um, as a database administrator or um, or a security person, you you worried about okay, how I'm going to have a low latency between my on-prem and the cloud, you know, which mm -hmm. application I migrate. And if I migrate, should I use a VM to VM migration or should I adopt more cloud native tools? So there are a lot of questions, a lot of confusion, right? Um, so that's where I think the challenge is, is, is first of all, deciding which one to pick, why mm -hmm. something uh, as an organization they should ad adopt. And then, and then also with everybody in the organization now has to, adopt and learn uh, the cloud skills. Uh, so it, it's a lot of things happening at one time. Now, if you go from hybrid cloud to even multi-cloud, uh, you know, a organization adopt AWS Azure also. In that case, yep. uh, complexity is more even right now. Uh, you may have people who have to learn AWS Azure both and able to support the customers, uh, support the systems, and then now, which monitoring tool I use, what automation I put in place, which which can work across across the hybrid and multi cloud. So it's challenging, right? And I think that's where I think the adopting ad, uh, adapting to uh, the changes and uh, upskilling and using the right tooling is going to help uh, everybody. Michael, what do you consider? You know, in your opinion, what is the most important DBA skill today? Um, I will cover two areas. One is a more soft skill. Um, I think as a DBA, we got to adapt. We got to adapt to multiple, as Julie was saying earlier, multiple databases, not just one relation databases, but yeah. multiple engines. But not only relation databases, NoSQL databases, graph databases, time series databases. There are many column, columnar databases. There are many out there. Um, vector databases, right? There are many out there. So we have to adapt. We have to now look at generative AI, what generative AI is doing. So AI, machine learning. So we have to understand what 
data analytics and data scientists are doing so we can support them better. Uh, we have to learn uh, DevOps, you know, uh, different pipelines and whatnot. So we have to, so one important soft skill is adapt to the changes. If we if we don't adapt, we will get behind. Um, on the technical skill, um, I will say uh, definitely uh, AWS, Azure being the two primary cloud. Um, you know, as learn as much you can about uh, about cloud and AI. You know, so uh, learning AI will definitely uh, put you into the where you can help uh, all the AI projects, right? But also learning cloud will help you understand how to provision, monitor, uh, manage databases at scale uh, in your cloud environment. Julie, what do you consider, uh, you know, the most important skill for DBAs today? Yeah, so I think I think Michael, you think you said it perfectly. I remember when DBAs were gatekeepers, right, and they they really controlled that environment, um, and were really dictating, okay, what databases we're going to use and and what were what they could do. It's not that way anymore, right? Data is so collaborative uh, within a, a company that DBAs have turned into this collaboration hub, right? They're dealing with the developers who are using choosing database of choice, depending on the use case, right? Maybe they're doing something with vector, maybe they're doing a document and the DBAs have to adjust. The business wants access to their data. They want their applications running fast. The DBAs have to adjust. The executives want to go with cloud for save cost savings. They have to adjust. So I think that soft skill is incredibly important. Um, it is about collaboration, but I, and I also think, um, what you said about AI is really important too, right? It's moving fast. And so you have to be an expert at cloud and AI, you spend your time so that you can become a trusted advisor to your business and to your developers about what can be done and what can't be done, um, what can be done securely, what security concerns um, you know, are maybe not as important and are more fear-based and, and what can actually be done practically. Um, I think that's really important. So I would say those two things, right? You wanna be collaborative as a soft skill, um, and really uh, help your business forward, but also uh, make sure you're learning. You're, you can't stand still anymore in this role. Julie, are the days of just being a SQL Server or Oracle DBA? <laughs> For the most of us, there are. There are still pools, right? Leg these legacy, I mean, people have been talking about uh, the end of Oracle for a while, right? We have a great tool called Toad for Oracle, which is if you ever worked on Oracle, you've worked on Toad for Oracle. It's been around for over 25 years. Uh, we're not seeing a, a big decline with that tool, right? Because Oracle still owns the market and all these legacy tools are still running on Oracle databases or SQL Server databases. So there are lucky, uh, you know, little pods of people that can still stick with that one environment because they're supporting these really important legacy you know, mission critical databases. However, all the rest of us have to learn new things all the time, right? There's new databases being brought up every day. So if you're not in one of those trusted advisor positions, and usually those are DBAs that have been doing it for a while, right? And have gotten themselves into those roles and really are experts, uh, incredible technicians in those environments. If you're up and coming or you're mid-career, you probably don't have that luxury. Uh, and so, yeah, I'd say those days are gone for the vast majority of us. Understood, Michael, you're seeing this as well. Uh, yes and no. Let let me share what I what I when I say yes and no. Um, so there's a lot going in a SQL Server world. There are a lot of new features coming in. You can definitely spend a lot of time learning there, supporting your databases. You know, 2019 version, 2022 version, whatnot. Same for Oracle. Oracle coming with 23C. You can have vector search and whatnot. So you can definitely become expert there. Um, some organizations still have a lot of SQL Server, Oracle, and some critical databases, subsystems running. So sometimes you just don't have time because you just, you just bogged down with so much work. Um, so the days necessarily, I will say the golden days are over in the sense if you want to be in the demand, if you want to be in a growth mode and learning mode and help the organization in cloud and AI and many other things, you got to step outside the boundary in that case, definitely. So uh, SQL Server Oracle will be around another decade or two. It's, they're not, it's not going anywhere, yep. if, if not longer, right? Um, they are good tools, still coming with a lot of innovations. But but as a, you know, if I'm a DBA, I'm, I'm going to look at what how I'm going to help my organization. My organization is adopting cloud, there are a lot more new databases and I, I need to learn. So 
So I, I think I will do it more because I want to uh, learn that and support that growth compared to worried about where my job is, you know? So, um, but yeah, yeah it's, it's not necessarily a, a straight yes and no for me. Uh, and I know there are some, so many databases still because of our Oracle critical things running that yep. you can spend thousands and thousands of hours and still uh, innovating and modifying and, and learning that, so. Understood. Michael, how do you see, this is a question that I'm sure is on the minds of a lot of our attendees today. How do you see AI changing database management um, in the future? Um, AI, and I would say automation. So not each and every automation is AI driven. Uh, so we got to know the difference, right? So if there's a machine learning model or something, of course, it's driven by AI. If you're doing a generative AI, making an open AI call in your, you know, it's definitely AI uh, driven, right? But some are just predictions or thresholds, right? So, so I think AI automation, they both play, play a role. Um, now, the, the AI is changing uh, in two or three ways, right? One, if I'm a developer or a DBA, uh, open AI tool, whether it's a chat, chat GPT or Google Gemini or uh, Cloud3, Cloud um, there are many uh, large language, language models out there. That, that should be your sidekick in the sense, I need to write a program or a script. How can I do quickly? And, you know, let's say I'm new to MongoDB and I don't know how to upgrade or take a backup, right? I can quickly generate a Python script. Uh, but I don't want to write from scratch. I want I want the uh, generative AI uh, to help me. So one way is you want to use AI to be more efficient, uh, whether you're creating a blog, white paper, or script, uh, or programming. You got to use that AI and, and, and get there. That's one way. Uh, the second way is changing is uh, organizations are using large language model to create vectors. Uh, so if you have a text, a paragraph, book, could be any of those, image, video, uh, you may not have done anything before, but now you can create a vector out of it, right? You can call open AI, send a paragraph, it, you get a vector back. And now the idea there is I want to get semantic meaning out of, I'm not doing a keyword search anymore. I'm trying to understand what that paragraph means and, uh, and ask a question, right? So now I may have 100 documents or 1 million documents, I get a vector out of that, stored in a vector database, and now I can generate questions and I can mix and match in the sense I can use what I'll call RAG, which is your customized domain knowledge, plus the open large language model and really help internal customers, external customers. You have millions of products description, you can all vectorize it and let customer ask a question about, instead of a keyword search, customer might describe the problem or think they're looking, describe the thing rather than a keyword, right? And then you still be able to find it. So there are many hundreds of use cases, um, but that's how now you have to support vector databases, right? So you gotta learn the Postgres SQL vector search feature, MongoDB vector search feature, MySQL vector search feature, Pinecone and VV8 more vector databases uh, from ground up. So, so it's changing many ways. And I think that's where I mentioned earlier on, the AI is, it's not a myth, it's a real thing. Hund hundreds and thousands of companies already doing it. Uh, and if you are not learning, it's time to look into AI and start learning and help your, help yourself, help the company you're working for uh, with, the, uh, with the AI use case. Understood. Julie would love your thoughts on this. And also, you know, if there are things that DBAs should be doing to prepare their data environments right. uh, for AI. So I think you hit it right on the head, Michael. AI automation, right? You should be using all of these tools that you can, you know, within understanding their limits, certainly, but to enhance your productivity, right? There's no reason why you should be, you know, Google searching necessarily for a particular uh, syntax or anything when you, there's a much faster way to get there, right? But understanding the limits as well, too, right? I think we've all been in those situations where someone has said something and you're like, oh, I think they got that from AI. 
<laughs> I don't think that's quite right, right? You still use your critical thinking skills, right? It's not a replacement for, for your brain, right? It's just there to help you with productivity. So that's the one side of it. But I also think that your company, your organization is probably looking at how they can productize AI as well with their own data. Um, and I think what's key about that is understanding your not just your databases, but your data structures. You mentioned Erwin. Uh, Erwin's got a great product, uh, data intelligence, that helps you understand the data throughout the organization. Um, but really, I think understanding your data before you you feed it into AI or start utilizing an AI is really important as well, because you don't want to get to false positives. You don't want to get to situations where the data isn't structured well to give you good output. Still garbage in, garbage out world, right? That's just the way things work. Um, so I think understanding data landscape from like a metadata, a higher level perspective is really important for DBAs to be uh, uh, linchpins in the AI discussion as they look to productize their own their own data environments. Okay, moving on to another question. Julie, do you see database administrators and managers getting more involved in DevOps initiatives? Yeah, I don't see how you can't, right? So it, DBAs have been that uh, uh, the bottleneck, right, with DevOps, right? Because databases are different than code. Living in an environment, right? You're always data that exists and it has to add to any changes that happen. Um, so I think that they have to be part of that pipeline. They have to be uh, um, part of it moving fast to their environment. Everyone wants to get to their stuff fast or into their, either into their current or their own environment for their own users or out to customers. So yeah, I think that they're a critical part of it and often overlooked, but still a critical part. Understood. Michael, what are you seeing on your side? Uh, yeah, I think uh, we have to as a, as a DBA because end of the day, time to market, uh, application development, velocity, all that is very important, right? Um, and also the reliability is important, right? So that's where the pipeline come into, right? So you can have as simple as the the code and the database changes get promoted at the same time, a dev test fraud, right? Very simple change, right? Uh, but you can have as sophisticated as uh, in a very critical environment where a lot of things happening, you you actually creating a totally new infrastructure for new release. Uh, then you are deploying containers or applications and you, you know, you taking a, adding a node in your database. So it's, you know, in some ways it's a, a multi-node architecture, right? And then you uh, shifting the traffic slowly, right? So it's all those things, it could be very sophisticated pipeline like that, right? So as a DBA, we got to understand how these things work in the overall schema and why we're doing it, how we're doing it, and then helping the DevOps folks uh, bringing our script at the right stage, right? So so maybe, uh, and then some automated testing too. So in, in some cases, the pipeline will have quick testing to make sure everything going good before uh, it start to move any, you know, even 1% of the traffic to the new, uh, new setup, right? So all that has to be coordinated, work together. Um, and, you know, the, the DevOps culture is, is, is everybody adopting DevOps, and the reason is there are so many benefits because it brings you agility, it brings you, brings everybody on the same page. That's another you know, security application development, uh, DBA, database developers. It brings everybody on the same page. So yeah, I, I see that 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 has to happen for for us to be really successful uh, as a team together. Understood. Michael, is a vendor lock-in with cloud providers really a problem uh, nowadays? Um, it's a yes and no answer. I'll tell you why I say that. So anytime you are moving from one cloud to the cloud, there's always some work. You know, so, so what I mean there is permissions are going to be different. Each cloud provider has a different way to manage permissions, IAM or you know, role processes control. You can do have a different VMs possibly. Uh, so it's it's not not always easy going from one cloud to other, other provider. I think the bigger question will be why we, you're moving from one cloud to other cloud, right? Um, or in rare cases, uh, if that happens, you know, cloud back to on-prem, right? That's a very rare, but in a very rare case, it may happen. Um, so it's not all easy regardless uh, whether 
is a cloud native database or not now but at least it's possible and it's still within the reasonable time frame now as you start to adopt more and more cloud native solutions like for example AWS DynamoDB, which is only offered on DynamoDB. Uh, you start using more, uh, for example, AWS native services or Azure native services. Um, in some cases, there's not an easy replacement uh, going back to other cloud, right? So that's where it uh, is even get harder. Uh, so is a vendor lock-in a problem? Um, I don't think so. I, I, I think I think the, the moving between the clouds doesn't always give the benefit they're looking for. So you know, I rarely hear where somebody moved from one cloud to other cloud and all of a sudden everything is good. Uh, it's the other problems which cause the things to fail to begin with. You know, the reason for move maybe not the right reason. Um, so. Developing things like if you're using more VMs, containers, it's, it's a lot easier to move, move from one cloud to other cloud. If you're using serverless, more cloud native technologies, uh, then it definitely makes it a little bit harder. But in other case, you pay by consumption. Um, there's no licensing upfront. So you still can, you know, there's no vendor login as, as long as the only vendor lock, lock in is the dependency. Uh, not necessary that you locked in a pricing or any commitment or agreement so you can always move from cloud to cloud because there's no commitment or agreement to keep you there understood julie what are you seeing on this topic oh it looks like julie is just rejoining us i think she might have been having a technical issue um so i'm just gonna oh julie can you hear us i can i'm so sorry about that Hey, no worries at all. Um, so I was, just, I was just posing the question to you. Um, would love your thoughts on, the, you know, is vendor lock-in with cloud providers uh, really a problem? Uh, I think it's a perceived problem, right? I think uh, anybody feels uncomfortable when they get uh, maybe a little bit too much in bed with one vendor or not. It's really hard, though, because, you know, with Azure being so close to, you know, Microsoft products, it, it's easy to get into vendor lock-in with them and, and feel so comfortable because it's your environment. And I think you have to realize that, you know, there's choices you have to make. Even if you decide you're going to go full Kubernetes and you want to just do containers, you're sort of committing yourself to that strategy as well. And that might be more difficult later if you want to switch things out. So for me, um, yeah, I think it's important to consider, right? You need to look at your full landscape, make sure you're not over indexed, maybe in one area. But it's, you know, you need to question where that fear is coming from, too. I, I think we've got some good cloud providers out there, and I wouldn't be afraid to to create really strong partnerships with, with any of them. Understood. Okay, Julie, I'm going to give you the first crack at this next question. I want to get to at least one or two of our uh, attendee questions here before we close sure. up. Uh, the question is, what factors should organizations consider when selecting a cloud database solution for their specific use cases? Uh, I think the key is in the in the question, which is specific use cases, right? So I think there's good cloud providers out there, but you're going to pick the database or the services uh, that meet your needs. Um, and so, for example, as I mentioned, if, if you're a, a heavy Microsoft shop, uh, you know, you're using all of your enterprise softwares, Microsoft, then you might want to stick with Azure, right? That might make more sense for you with AWS. Uh, AWS has been doing a little bit longer and sometimes they provide more innovative services or at least they're seen that way. So if that's really fitting your use cases and your, your corporate identity better and where your future plans are, it might be a better one. So I think there, there's a lot of good choices out there. I think it's understanding what you're trying to drive from it and what's going to fit best with you, um, trying to predict as much as possible what you're going to do in the future as well. Michael, anything you'd like to add on this question? I think uh, Julie covered very well on uh, you know Azure versus AWS or any other cloud pro cloud provider. But I think this discussion might also mean when when you say specific use case, right? If I have a small transaction database uh, with you know ten thousand patients, you know I'm just keeping patient records doesn't need a high throughput need or anything. I might be okay with relation database and it could be open source, it could be SQL Server, Oracle, it could be any of those, right? But on the other hand, if you have, let's say, um, a global operations with uh, 1 million sensors for 
water leakage or or the car you may have you know a lot of cars uber for example right uh, which sending data for example now you have a streaming of data coming right and a lot of this could be json uh, documents so that's where the NoSQL databases might fit better you know or you have a data coming from a machine which has a timestamp in that case you might go for time series database or the database where the relationship is more important you know for example um you're trying to figure out the friendship uh, meaning or who who owns a car compared to what i feel about a car right now is you think about relationship between different objects and that's where graph database might come in so so i think it depends on the different use case uh, definitely uh, but there are so many databases out there now uh, picking the right database for the right use case is the way to go compared to try to fit everything into just one database technology understood and one more question before we break and i thank our audience for sticking with us um, and Michael, I'll let you have first crack at this. Any tool for data observability and governance through the life cycle? So database, data observability, uh, Quest has a very good tool, Foglight. Uh, there are many other tools out there, right? So, so I think when it comes to data observability and governance, uh, you're talking beyond databases, right? Your data could be in object storage, uh, it could be files, um, structured data, unstructured data, it could be in Hadoop. So there are many places where your data could be. Um, so as you are, have your life cycle, you know, the question is life cycle here, right? So as you ingesting data, um, you know, what your sources are and uh, how you cleaning, transforming your data. Uh, and in some cases you've changing the format because uh, the parquet format for example will process faster for example right so as you're going through the entire end to end you want to identify all the places where data will be stored whether it's a database or or a lake or or a tool and then you want to look at uh, the observability whether it's just a heartbeat check whether it's a uh, trigger so if, if something doesn't fall you initiate a trigger to um, let people know that something has arrived or, or or it has arrived you know so building that tooling end to end so that you can understand as you're ingesting data uh, you know you, you your observability tool is kind of monitoring everything uh, governance is very important because that's where you might say i have tons and tons of unstructured data um, how i make sure that only the right people can go there right so that's where assigning the permissions at the time of creating the object is going to be an important factor. Thanks, Michael. And Julie, anything you'd like to add on this uh, question? No, I, I think that, that that what you what Michael had mentioned here, it, those are all important factors. I would say that, you know, make sure you understand, are you asking for database observability or data observability, right? Because those are oftentimes different tool sets with different focus. As you mentioned, our fog light is database observability. It's going to tell you if you're running right, if you're optimized, queries are taking too long, all that kind of stuff. Uh, data observability is different, as you were talking about, Michael, right? It's how, your data across your landscape, all of your data engineering pipelines, how are they running? What is, you know, being able to point at any one spot and, and finding the, the lineage of that data? Uh, we have a tool for that too, <laughs> called data intelligence. But I think those are two different things to understand is, am I looking at my, my Okay, it looks like we lost Julie there. Well, we covered a ton of ground today. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. And I wanna give a huge thank you to our speakers today for coming on board and uh, sharing their insights and expertise. Once again, Julie Hyman, Director of Product Management at Quest and Michael Argarwal, uh, Director and Global Practice Leader of Cloud Databases at DataVail. So if you in attendance would like to review this presentation or send it to a colleague, you can use the same exact URL that you used for today's live event. It will be archived and you will receive an email once the archive is posted. And if you would like a PDF of the deck, you can go to the handout section once the archive is live. Also, as I mentioned earlier, just for participating in today's event, you could win this $100 Amazon gift card. The winner will be announced on April 29th. We'll let you know if you're the lucky viewer. 
Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you.